As we approach the millennium, the power of our technology is awesome. But despite our vast ability to solve problems and build complex machines, there are many questions we still cannot answer. Ours is, in fact, a mysterious world, a vast landscape of compelling wonders. He wrote Chariots of the Gods. Now author Eric Von Daniken guides us through the search for ancient technology, including did our ancestors know how to fly thousands of years before the airplane was invented? A dangerous ritual honors the gods, but were these mythic gods or real beings from another world? How did our ancestors build incredible monuments that defy understanding even today? And genetic engineering. Is it possible we are just rediscovering a science observed thousands of years ago? These and other mysteries in our search for ancient technology, next. idea of a primitive culture coming in contact with a more sophisticated culture, whether they are of this world or from another planet, is a very important concept. As history proves, the lower culture always tried to imitate the technology of the higher culture. One especially impressive example of this phenomenon is the mystery of ancient flight. Is it possible our ancestors experienced air travel thousands of years before the invention of the airplane. From ancient India to medieval Europe, the dream of flight has fascinated every culture on every continent throughout history. Human beings have gone to extraordinary lengths to conquer the skies. Not until the Wright brothers in 1903 did we finally succeed. Or is this just conventional wisdom? Some researchers now believe there may be clues in our distant past that could cast some doubt on aviation history as we know it. In the jungles of Colombia, a baffling discovery raises the mysterious question is it possible ancient cultures experienced real flight hundreds of years ago? I have some strange objects here found in pre-Columbian tombs, dated about 800 to 600 before Christ. Archaeologists believe that these must be insects. Perhaps a part of a pre-Inca cult which revealed insects. But when closely examined, these figures don't look like insects at all. Insects have their wings on the top of their bodies. Here the wings are on the bottom. So what are these strange figures if they are not insects? They look like airplanes. The amulets look like airplanes. Bob Trelease is an expert in the study of early flight. They have the shape, the physical structure, they had the elements that make an airplane as we recognize it today. These ancient figures reminded Bob Trelease of a very specific plane. When I saw the amulet, I immediately associated it with the shape of the F4D. The shape matched it. The apparent resemblance between the modern combat jet and the ancient icon is striking. But could it just be a coincidence? When Bob Trelease noticed something else peculiar about the golden figures, he began to wonder what the reality was behind this mystery. The curlicues looked like they could be a engineering representation of turbulent air over the leading edge of the wing. 
Were our ancestors experimenting with real flights, or perhaps were they expressing some kind of mythology? Could it be both? One possible answer comes from anthropological discoveries made in the 20th century. When one culture with a simple technology comes into contact with a second culture with a more complex technology, people often turn to religion. Anthropologist Dr. Lamont Lindstrom offers one explanation for the existence of these figurines. It may be found in the anthropological concept known as cargo cult. Cargo cult is a South Pacific example of a kind of religious movement that's happened almost every place in the world. Life in the South Pacific prior to World War II was pre-industrial in its simplicity. There was no electricity. There were no roads and no radio. No contact with the outside world. Overnight, World War II brought amazing treasures from distant worlds to these remote islands. Airplanes descended from the sky and opened their doors. Out flowed a deluge of military equipment and technology, which the islanders had never seen before. To them, the radio was a wonder, a magical machine able to speak in many voices. So people who had lived a very simple life for generations over a very short period of time experienced an incredible amount of new technology that just poured across the shore and came into their lives. And then when the war ended, the cargo suddenly disappeared. Desperate to find some way to bring the cargo back, the islanders turned to prayer and religious ritual. Much of the ritual of cargo cult uh, attempts to try to attract the return of whoever controls the cargo. They did things like, uh, in many islands, cut airstrips in the forest, in the jungles, hoping that the planes would land again. They built model planes. Sometimes these were small models, sometimes almost life-size models and put these planes on the airfield as a kind of imitation, some device that will encourage the cargo planes to land. Using the cargo cult theory, were these gold artifacts created by ancient Indians modeled after mysterious aircraft from long ago? One way to examine this mystery was to see if the amulets were aerodynamically sound and might have been able to fly. Captain Peter Belding, a pilot and air traffic controller, built exact scale models of these icons out of molded plastic. Although it is unknown whether the amulets might represent powered aircraft or gliders, Captain Belding made them self-propelling. He attached a small prop motor to one, and in the other, he placed a turboprop engine. Now Captain Belding tests the more powerful turboprop model. The sight of these models in the sky raises intriguing questions about the icons on which they are based. The idea that they were copied from a working airplane in existence 800 years before the birth of Christ is very difficult to believe. Could these tiny gold figurines be models of airplanes built by ancient people? Of course, but there is another possibility. I believe they are religious artifacts which were designed to honor extraterrestrial flying machines and lure these visitors back down to Earth. Here again, we have a case of so-called cargo cults, imitation cults. Pre-Columbian people saw something flying up there, so it had to do with the gods. They made these models, they covered them with gold, and today we found out they really do fly. 
If this were the only clue suggesting flight in the ancient world, it would be easy to ignore the whole idea as pure fantasy. But elsewhere in South America, there are more intriguing clues about the mystery of ancient flying machines. The small town of Samapata in central Bolivia seems frozen in history, an untouched oasis from a simpler time. Penetrating this remote wilderness requires a long, difficult journey, even with modern transportation. Here the mountains hide a centuries-old mystery that could relate to the possibility of flight in ancient times. Silent and alone, a strange mountain called El Fuerte juts into the sky. El Fuerte, the Spanish word for fortress. A fortress cut out of the rock by pre-Inca tribes? Perhaps. A sanctuary? Most likely. But if it was a fortress or a sanctuary, why don't we find in all of South America a comparable place? Experts are baffled by El Fuerte. Its design does not suggest to scholars any traditional military or religious function. And although experts estimate that El Fuerte predates the arrival of the Inca people in this region, around 1400, its age is uncertain. The most distinctive feature of El Fuerte is a pair of parallel grooves about 100 feet long, which have been etched into the rock. They run from the bottom of the bare face all the way to the top. Let's look closer at these strange grooves. Obviously, they point to the sky. To me, it looks like a launching ramp with which they catapulted some flying objects towards heaven. Flying objects which they had observed being used by their gods. To achieve flight, all aircraft must travel fast enough during takeoff for the wings to generate lift. Where space for takeoff is limited, such as the deck of an aircraft carrier, a catapult must be used. This steam-powered launcher is so powerful, it can accelerate a 65,000-pound jet to a speed of 150 miles per hour in only 300 feet. On the top of the mountain, a circular structure with rectangular and triangular notches has been carved into the rock. This could have been the installation on which a rope made of rubber was wound around. Rubber was known to pre-Inca tribes long time ago. The tight rope was attached to the flying object below. Then the anchors were knocked away and the object took off into the sky. Could El Fuerte really be a primitive launching pad? Or is this possibly another example of imitative behavior on the part of ancient people? I believe our ancestors watched the gods descend in carriages which looked like planes. People were awed of these flying machines and worshipped them. This led into a cargo cult, meaning to imitate these flying machines with primitive earthly technology. For 300 years, from 900 to 1200 AD, Tula was the capital of the Toltec Empire. Located an hour north of what is now Mexico City, this ancient metropolis was the hub of the great Toltec trading network, stretching from the American Southwest to Costa Rica. At its peak, Tula was a densely packed city of perhaps 60,000 people. 
Do these ancient statues depict great Toltec rulers, famous warriors, or perhaps religious figures? Or are they something entirely different? Do these ancient statues depict great Toltec rulers, famous warriors, or perhaps religious figures? Or are they something entirely different? Scholars interpret these statues as depicting warriors ready for battle. On the chest is a butterfly, a traditional Toltec costume element. Held in their hands is an altal, the unique central Mexican spear. On the shoes are flowers, which symbolize the gentleness of King Topiltzin, who first made Tula the capital of the empire. Now really, strange warriors with butterflies on their chest and flowers on their shoes. In my opinion, the ancestors of the Toltecs had contact with extraterrestrials, which they worshipped as the gods. Centuries later, they tried to imitate these gods, because they had only oral history. Many details were lost or not understood at all. Could this object on the chest, which clearly is attached with straps, be a life support system, or the object in the hand, a powerful weapon? Though researchers dispute this interpretation, the true meaning of the Toltec statues remains a mystery. Could ancient cultures have been influenced by visitors from another world? To some, archaeological findings elsewhere in the region keep this question alive. Tikal, the oldest and largest city ever built by the ancient Mayans. Tikal was first settled in 600 BC and flourished for 1500 years, creating one of the most scientifically advanced civilizations on Earth at the time. The Mayans were able to develop an original set of timekeeping, of astronomy, of uh, cosmology that is unique and, and fascinating. Dr. Brian Penpraise is a professor of ancient astronomy at Pomona College in California. The Mayan pyramids were built for ritual purposes. Some of them had observatories on the top of them. They had a series of priests that would inhabit the temples and record their observations in writing. But the observations were very simple. The priest would stand on top of the temple and look. These observations, carefully recorded over months and years, became the basis of Mayan astronomy. Without the benefit of telescopes or satellites, the priests began to unlock the mysteries of the heavens. The pyramids became the focus of religious and scientific learning. The pyramid of the double-headed serpent is more than 20 stories high. It was the tallest structure anywhere in the Americas for almost a thousand years. Only the invention of the elevator at the turn of the 20th century allowed buildings to grow taller. The pyramids were based on astronomical alignments, but they were more importantly a point in which the, the people could communicate with gods. What gods? were honored at this most sacred place in the Maya cosmology. An inscription found right here says that some heavenly beings descended once to Tikal. Did the Mayas expect the return of these visitors from the sky someday? Were the pyramids some kind of uh, receiving platforms for the gods? or? Is this all just a legend? I believe it's true. The Mayas did expect the return of their gods every 52 years. If true, what did these travelers, these gods, look like? I believe we have an answer right here in Tikal. Could this be the face of a visitor from outer space? I believe that the design surrounding this face is actually the helmet of a spacesuit. 
Even though the head of this carving has been broken off, there are many provocative details to be found. You can see what I'm talking about on this drawing of the outline of the stone carving. I believe this is an air hose which ends in a box fitted with some kind of air bladder. I see more hoses leading either into or out of the large figure's boots. Could the ancient Mayans have been trying to depict a visitor from another planet wearing an atmosphere controlling spacesuit? Does this statue suggest a Mayan close encounter? Is it possible the Maya misinterpreted technology they did not understand? Whatever the ancient sculptors intended, they have passed down to us a compelling mystery. But perhaps the most intriguing of all the mysteries surrounding this ancient people dates back to the very dawn of the Mayan culture. The beginning of a calendar is usually a very important event. Our calendar, for example, starts with the birth of Christ. The Maya calendar was completely different to the calendar we use today. Transposed onto our calendar, the Maya calendar begins on August 11, 3114 BC. The Mayas didn't even exist then, but their calendar starts there. But what happened 3114 BC in Central America? This is handed down precisely in the book of the Jaguar priest. It was the year when the gods arrived. This is when they descended the path of the stars. They spoke the magic language of the stars in the sky. Yes, their sign gives us certainty that they will again descend from the heavens. The thirteen gods and the nine gods. And there will be a new order to what they once created. The idea that gods descended to Earth thousands of years ago is common in the mythology of many Central American cultures. I believe we see an example of this in a stunning folk ritual carried out in Mexico. These are the fearless voladores. Voladores means those who fly. After participating in the sacred dance, Five brave men climb one after the other to the top of a 100-foot-tall pole. Any carelessness, any mistake, any slight miscalculation could bring this ritual to a sudden end. But the Voladores preparation has been thorough. We've been preparing since we were 10. But for other people who aren't prepared, it's dangerous. Recreating a ritual begun 3,000 years ago, the men finally reach the top. Each man carefully winds a rope clockwise around the top of the pole. Each member of the team must carefully layer his rope with the others. The platform begins to rotate. The most dangerous part of the ritual is about to begin. The four men lean backward off the platform, and then they're flying. Some maintain each of the voladores reflects the points of the compass. Others say the rite is part of a larger celebration, related to the movement of the sun and stars. Each one of us represents earth, air, fire, and water. The flute player represents the sun god, El Caparel. When the ritual first began, a tree would be cut down, stripped of its bark, and erected in the center of town. The ropes were made of vines or woven hemp. The length of this rope is calculated in a way that each of the four Indians circles 
the tree exactly 13 times. 4 times 13 are 52, and this is the basic figure of the Maya calendar. Los Voladores, as they are called today, represent the descending of the gods from the sky to earth. Gods, which in my eyes were extraterrestrials and whose return were expected every 52 years. When it comes to achievements in ancient architecture, one of the most mysterious is the awe-inspiring Great Pyramid of Giza in Egypt. The mysteries surrounding the Great Pyramid are well known. The controversy over who built this massive stone structure and how remains intense, but simple mathematics brings the mystery into sharper focus. Experts estimate that the pyramid contains a total of two and a half million stone blocks ranging in size from 2 to 40 tons. Chronicles of the Times report the construction took 20 years. But how could such a gigantic monument be built so quickly? Now let's divide 2.5 million stone blocks by 20. And we can put 125,000 blocks every year. How many days a year have they been working? Let's say 300 days a year. Okay. So we have a daily output of 416 blocks. And how many hours have they been working? There were no unions in those days. Let's say 12 hours a day. That's a long day. Finally, we have every hour 34 blocks. And if we divide it down to the minutes, in fact, every two minutes, one block. To me, this is impossible. I believe the Great Pyramid was built by human beings, but with help from extraterrestrials. It's the only way our relatively primitive ancestors could create something we could perhaps not duplicate even today. There are many theories about how such a massive structure was built 5,000 years ago. As the debate rages, the pyramids of Egypt stand silently sentinels of the past, forever guarding their mysteries. There are many other mysterious structures around the globe that defy conventional engineering wisdom, like Stonehenge, the famous carvings of Easter Island, and the ancient Inca ruins of Machu Picchu in Peru. But there is yet another Inca ruin in Peru that presents one of the most perplexing puzzles, the ancient fortress of Sacsayhuaman. The Incas had only crude tools and no knowledge of the wheel, yet they built this massive fortress. How is a fascinating mystery. In 1488, the Inca Empire included 10 million people. Amazingly, it was all brought to an end by the arrival of a mere 180 gold-hungry Spanish mercenaries in 1532. In the remote outpost of Sacsayhuaman, the Incas suffered their final bloody defeat. The historical record of the final days of the Incas is fairly well documented. The details relating to how the Incas built Sacsayhuaman have been lost in the fog of history. Here, stone blocks weighing up to 100 tons were fit together in such a perfection that not even the blade of a knife will fit between. And as in Egypt, all this was done without cement. Hundreds of massive stones were used to build these walls. Despite their awesome size and weight, they fit together with laser-like precision. 
And what's more, experts have determined that these huge stones were quarried far away and moved here to this remote site. How were these massive stones cut so cleanly with only crude tools? How were they transported across the mountains without horses or wheeled vehicles? And how were they fit together with such precision? Is it possible these ancient builders were taught engineering secrets by visitors from another world? The answers to these questions were forever lost when the Inca Empire crumbled. The mystery of Sacsayhuaman still haunts these stones, hiding secrets we may never unravel. Half a world away in France, more giant stones stand in silence. Yet they may be thousands of years older than the astounding creations of the Incas. Centuries ago, these megaliths were erected. The word megalith comes from the Greek. Mega, meaning large, and lithos, meaning stone. Some of these megaliths weigh up to 300 tons. Experts are unsure who the ancient builders were who put these behemoths in place how they were arranged, and when. Without any man-made substances attached, stones cannot be scientifically dated. Just off the coast of Brittany in northern France is a ring of stones that only deepens the mystery. There is a great deal of controversy about the age of these megaliths in Brittany. Here, we finally have some proof. These stones go into the water and under water. In fact, there is an entire stone circle under water. This proves that the stones were here before the water was here. And that was eight to 10,000 years ago. According to von Daniken, these stones were placed before the end of the Ice Age. When the ice melted, the water level rose, covering the area and making placement of the stones impossible. Eight to 10,000 years ago, people were hunter-gatherers with no knowledge of engineering and only crude tools. How could these primitive people have placed these stones before the sea rose to cover them? I believe that this planet was visited a long time ago by extraterrestrials. Of course, the extraterrestrials did not create these wonders. Our ancestors did that. But these structures were intended as a form of worship to the gods, the teachers who came down from heaven. The people were inspired and erected these creations to honor these visitors. One of the most controversial technologies of the 20th century is genetic engineering. The ability to manipulate life at its most elemental level offers great promise and great danger. Eric von Danigan believes there are clues in ancient Egypt only now rediscovered which point to an astonishing mystery. Is it possible the secrets of genetic engineering were discovered thousands of years ago? Genetic engineering involves moving individual genes between organisms. Molecular biologist Dr. Judith Lingell is experimenting with genetic engineering at the University of Southern California in Los Angeles. The purpose of genetic engineering is to take the properties conferred by a single gene and incorporate those properties then into another organism. Dolly the sheep was created through genetic engineering for commercial breeding purposes. But tampering with the building blocks of life can be frightening. Like the splitting of the atom. This is a discovery that carries burdens as well as benefits. Genetic engineering terrifies many people. In the future, genetic engineering could change the characteristics of a human being with beneficial results or with dangerous consequences we cannot even imagine. 
Eric von Daniken believes we have already witnessed the devastating impact of genetic engineering out of control. Luxor, one of the greatest of all ancient Egyptian cities. I believe we find clues here that genetic engineering may have been attempted thousands of years ago. All over Egypt, you find creatures like these. What is the meaning of it? Status showing the combination of human and animal forms are common in the ruins of ancient Egypt. Legends say it was 11,340 years ago that the gods descended from heaven. These gods created beasts, monsters, mixed creatures of all kinds. There were bulls with the head of human. There were dogs who had wings and the tails of a fish. They were created by the gods. And the gods were the teacher from heaven, and the teacher from heaven were nothing else than the extraterrestrial. All what is left is the question, why should some extraterrestrial civilization do such a thing? We know from our little space knowledge that there are planets which are maybe hotter than the Earth or cooler than the Earth. So maybe you need a creature which is intelligent, as we are, but has a different body to resist heat or to resist the cool or whatever. So they used our existing genetic material. They mixed it in a new form. They made what we would call today genetic engineering. And voila! we had some of these monsters. Beneath the shifting sands of the ancient city of Saqqara, von Daniken has found what he claims are new clues that the ancient Egyptians lived in fear of one of the genetically engineered creatures. Ancient Egypt was a culture of herdsmen. Cattle represented wealth and were a staple of their diet. Bulls were especially revered and represented strength and dignity. The holy Apis bull was the most sacred of all these animals. However, according to von Daniken, some accounts indicate that the Apis bull was feared rather than revered. In ancient hieroglyphs, the Egyptian scribes tell stories of a less than benevolent god, as represented by the dreaded and wrathful Apis bull. For example, the uh, holy bull Apis destroyed temple, killed people. So he was really a monster. Finally, these monsters died. Now, the priests wanted to avoid that some of these monsters could be reborn. That's why they made subterranean caves. This is the entrance to a huge underground tomb, referred to as the Serapeum. Scholars believe it was designed as the final resting place for the holy Apis bull. This subterranean cave was discovered in 1852 by the French archaeologist Auguste Mariette. As you can see, I myself, I am five feet and five inches high, but this sarcophagus is higher than myself. And by the way, the lower part is 80 tons and the cover another 30 to 35 tons. The archaeologists expected to find mummified bulls, but when the cover was taken away, inside was a mass of asphalt with thousands of teeny broken bones. What a mystery. It was normal in ancient Egypt to mummify everybody so that he could be resurrected, that he had a new life, an afterlife. But to have an afterlife, the whole body was needed. Why not in this case? Maybe they wanted to prevent to be resurrected this monster inside. 
No bones were ever discovered in the Serapeum that have been identified as the bones of a bull. Scholars are undecided on the exact nature of the remains that were found there. Whatever it was, was not mummified in the way Egyptians preserved creatures so that they could live again. Perhaps the Apis bull was a gift from the gods that the ancient Egyptians wanted to be forgotten. I'm standing in the plain of Nazca. It looks like an empty desert, like nothing, but it's not. The real mysteries of the plain of Nazca can be seen only from above. These enormous etchings in the desert floor are believed to have been made between 200 BC and 800 AD. Some of these strange lines are more than 15 miles long. Now, a new mystery has come to light. I have just discovered something new and incredible about Nazca. This strange figure has confused experts for a long time. It's not like any of the other figures on the desert floor. What purpose might be served by such an elaborate pattern? Although there is no agreement, some experts believe that the lines and figures were used in religious ceremonies or were part of a giant astronomical calendar. My interpretation relates back to the idea of a cargo cult. I believe the ancient Nazcans saw some kind of a spaceship land. The vehicle left a mark on the desert floor. When the extraterrestrials returned into the sky, the Nazcans wanted them to come back. So they recreated the strange markings to lure the visitors back to Earth. The complicated geometry contained in this massive engraving reminds me of some kind of navigational beacon which would guide the extraterrestrials back to Earth. So far, it hasn't worked. Maybe someday it will, and the visitors from another world will land once again on the timeless plain of Nazca. The lines and figures of Nazca have drawn researchers for decades. Though no single explanation has evolved, the mystery remains a tantalizing challenge open to all. The world of our ancestors is full of riddles. But only the knowledge we have today allows us to look at these ancient societies with new eyes, to ask new questions, to seek new answers to the secrets of our past. Like all great mysteries, we have to keep investigating until we find not the answer we're looking for, but the truth itself. <laughs>